On a Friday afternoon in 2022, Lex was at home, just doing some routine work on her laptop. It seemed like just a normal day. It did not turn out to be normal. In fact, what happened that day started Lex on a journey she never could have predicted. And by the way, the story you're about to hear does not include any violence. But there is blood. A lot of blood. Real people in unreal situations. There is a girl hanging by her broken leg from the telephone wire. And I called 911 and I said, I found a baby. I turned around. I see a gun pointed at me close enough I could touch it. She would hold our heads underwater all the time. He levels the gun, pulls the trigger. And I go down. Her eyes were full of tears. She didn't want to leave us. My hair catches on fire. I swear to God, this is this image is burning my head for the rest of my life. I'm Scott Johnson, and this is What Was That Like? As you listen to my conversation with Lex, you're going to get to know her pretty well. Even as she was very young, she knew what she wanted to do. I grew up with my mom and dad and two sisters in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I knew from really early on that what I wanted most in life was to be a mom and have babies. And then I also figured out pretty early that I wanted to be a midwife. Like I wanted this to be my whole life about sort of procreation and raising small humans. But then, as a teenager, things got a little confusing. Then when I was 15 and I figured out that I was gay, the hardest part for me about that realization was wondering, like, how will I have babies? And that was my focus for my teenage years. So not a, not a typical adolescence. In that sense that, you know, I, I always felt like if I had been straight, I would have been like high risk for becoming a teen mom because it was all I wanted to do. So she graduated high school, left home and started looking for a life partner. And things happened pretty quickly. I met my first wife the first semester in college. I was 18. She was my first girlfriend. She was older. She was a senior. And somehow I convinced her to marry me. And as soon as I graduated, I got pregnant. So all, all, so far, all of my dreams were going according to plan. It turned out that I was pregnant with twins. So I had twin babies right out of college. Um, they were born nine months to the day from my college graduation. And then a few years later, I had another baby. And then my wife carried our fourth son. And soon after that is when our marriage started to fall apart. And that's when she met Meg. Meg and I actually met at a support group for nursing mothers. Her first baby was four months old, and I had the twins who were two at the time, and we became friends. I wouldn't say we became, like, excellent best friends. There was always some amount of distance, but I was enamored with her from the get-go. We were both married to other people, and our friendship grew over the next few years. Then we accidentally fell completely in love. It wasn't a conscious choice in any way, and it wasn't something that we really realized was happening until it was already completely established of this like intense, mind-blowing feeling that I had never experienced that I didn't even know was a way a person could feel. I still say falling in love was with Meg like the best thing that ever happened to me, even though it was also incredibly challenging because 
at that point. I had four young children. She had two young children. We were both relatively happily married to other people, um, like not, there wasn't any fighting or it wasn't as if we had bad marriages that we were leaving. It was just more like we hadn't had this intense love with the other, with our first partners. Ultimately, we made the decision to leave our marriages and be together. And so when that happened, our kids were ages one, two, three, five, and the twins were seven. And now Lex and Meg had to figure out how to make this work, including deciding on careers. We had both been primarily stay-at-home mothers up until then, so we had to figure out a way to support ourselves and navigate, you know, sharing custody with our exes and all the traumas of divorce. So the early, early years were really challenging. You work as a lactation consultant. Yes. Do you know what that is? <laughs> I, I help people I know what, feed their babies. Yeah. Right. You, you see a lot of boobs. I do. I do. I see a lot of newborns, a lot of boobs, talk about milk all day. And what does Meg do? Meg is a high school English teacher. Overall, Lex felt like she was in pretty good health, except for a particular pain that started in the early part of the pandemic. I had been having this intense pain on the left side of my torso, like sort of under my ribs, that would come and go. And it was very intense. I had had previously an appendicitis and I had had an ectopic pregnancy, and I had had a burst ovarian cyst. So I had been through some painful, like, go to the hospital, have emergency surgery situations previously in my life. And when I first was having this pain on the left side of, of my body, it felt like that level of pain, like I should probably go to the hospital. But I didn't ever, you know, I just, it was like the early days of the pandemic and going to the hospital wasn't a thing you did. So I didn't go to the ER. I just like lived through it for a few hours and the pain subsided. But when it kept happening, I did go to the doctor about it. And ultimately I had an upper endoscopy and a colonoscopy and everything looked clear. And my GI doctor at the time told me it was possible that it was like in my head and that I was just stressed out, you know, being home with all these seven kids during the pandemic. And he suggested that I start, you know, taking an SSRI. So I felt incredibly dismissed. And I did start taking an SSRI, which I enjoyed. What is what is that? An SSRI, that's like an antidepressant, anti-anxiety medication. So then I was like, well, yeah, it didn't affect. I was still having these like probably once a week painful kind of like a spasm that would last a few hours. I felt like I had done everything I could to investigate it and with going to a doctor and having these tests. And so, yes, I think I thought I was in good health and that it was just something I had to work through. Like maybe it was being caused by anxiety or I don't know. And then it happened on a Friday afternoon. You were at home, just doing some work, just sitting at your dining yes. room table. I was sitting at the dining room table. I was doing some charting for my job on my laptop and texting a friend. And I felt fine, totally comfortable, wasn't in any pain. And then I thought that I just had to fart. So I, I did, but I felt like you know, what I assumed was like diarrhea come out with the fart. What, what do the kids say? I sharted. <laughs> There's a word for everything now. <laughs> yeah, there is. So I quickly rushed into the bathroom and sat on the toilet and was having diarrhea. And I, you know, took my unders off to rinse them in the sink. And I saw that it was blood that was coming off of them, but I just assumed that I had gotten my period. And I was like, oh, I, yeah, I just probably didn't 
like it wasn't enough of a shart to get in my underwear, but I had gotten my period and that's why they're wet with blood. And I was sitting there just like having this really intense cramping and diarrhea, like liquid diarrhea. Because I had been in such a rush to get to the toilet, I hadn't brought my phone with me or anything. So I was just kind of on toilet lock and I couldn't do anything, but I felt this intense sort of heat that started in my head and like rushed down through my body like I was fainting and like everything, you know, I lost my hearing and everything went sort of black. I had fainted before at a concert as a teenager. So it felt like that. I felt like fainting, but then I like, you know, waited for it to end and it wouldn't really end like the feeling of fainting. And I just still just having diarrhea, having diarrhea. I couldn't really come back to consciousness. I really had no idea what was happening. I don't know how long that was going on for, but at some point I heard one of my kids get home and I was able to call to her to say, can you get me my phone and just put it under the bathroom door? And so she did. And as soon as I had my phone, I called Meg, my wife. She had been working close by that day, which is unusual. Usually she would be, you know, 45 minutes away at her job, but she had the day off. So she was just at a cafe close by. I called her and I said, I don't know what's happening, but something is wrong. I'm having diarrhea and I can't stop fainting. And she said that she could just tell from my voice that all she needed to do was just get home immediately. And she she kept me on the phone. She had me try putting my head between my legs. Eventually, she suggested I lie on the bathroom floor. I guess I wasn't having diarrhea anymore. And I remember the cool tiles felt really good. Like I felt really hot. And she was home within five minutes. And so when she walked in the door, she said it looked like a murder scene. Like there was just blood everywhere. It splattered all like the entirety of the toilet bowl was smeared all around. And I was just passed out on the bathroom floor. And she was saying, it's all blood. There's blood everywhere. And I was like, I, I think I got my period. And she was like, no, like this, you are bleeding from your butt. And I was like, oh. And she said, I think I have to take you to the hospital. And I said, yeah, uh, but I can't move. And she was like, okay, I'm calling 911. You were out of consciousness en in and out enough that you didn't yeah. even realize all that blood was there? No, I still thought it was just like diarrhea. Yeah, I I hadn't looked at it. I It felt like having liquid diarrhea. And I, yeah, I couldn't really see. And so you can't get up and that's obviously that's the time to call 911. 911, the signs are quarter. Where is your emergency? Is there an apartment number or is that a single family home? Single family. Can I have your phone number, please? And can I have your first name? Meg. Meg, tell me exactly what happened. Um, my wife called. She said she was not feeling well, that she kept fainting, didn't know why, and I just came home as fast as I could and found her on the bathroom floor. Um, she's in and out of fainting, and she's pooping blood, a lot of it. Okay. So you said she, is she unconscious right now? Um, she not in exactly. In and out. Okay. Uh, let me ask you a few more questions. You said you're with her right now? No. I'm right there right now. How old is she? 41. Okay. Is she awake or is she unconscious currently? Um, in between. Okay. And is she breathing? Very pale. She's not good. Is she breathing? Yes. 
Okay. Let me ask you a few more questions. Is she breathing com um, completely normal? It looks like it, yeah. It feels like it. And, she, and you said she's still unconscious. Are you in and out of it? Yeah, in and out. Okay. I'm going to start to respond to Santa Line. I got a few more questions, okay? Okay. Mm. Keep breathing, babe. The same one this morning. She's She's really getting pale. Yep, they're going to be on the way, okay? Just stay on the line with okay. me. Is your door unlocked? Yeah, it's unlocked. <laughs> Anything will do, Aviva. Anything. All right, I'm sending the paramedics to help you now. Stay on the line and tell you exactly what to do next, okay? Okay. Are you right by her right now? Yes, I'm right here. Okay, how's her breathing status? She's breathing, but she's um, starting to tremble, getting paler, and talking about how thirsty she is. Okay, so she is able to respond to you and talk to you, correct? I wouldn't say it's responding. Okay, so is she altered? Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm going to stay on the line so we Thank you. Uh, get there. And uh, you said there's someone else home with you? Uh, yes, kids, not adults. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I want you to just keep updating me on our breathing status, okay? Yeah, that part is okay. Okay. Does she have any kind of underlying medical condition that would cause her to do this? Um, not that we know of. She has in the past had a burst ovarian cyst mm -hmm. okay. that was, was very severe, involved was a lot of internal bleeding. Was she complaining about anything earlier? Not today, no. Okay. You said she was passing bloody stool? Yeah, a lot. Okay. Uh, not not bloody stool, just uh, like blood. Hold on one second, please. Like liquid. And it's very five. Jenny responding. One year old female, in and out of consciousness, not completely alert. She is currently awake and breathing. We should be responding 15, 53. And Meg, do you have any pets in the residence? Pets, yeah. Yes. Are your kids able to put them away so that when the responders show up that they won't run out? Yeah, let me call the kids right now. Hang on. Kids, Aviva, I need you to be right with me on this, okay? An ambulance is literally coming. I need you to put the dogs away. And I want you to take Edith upstairs. Take Edith upstairs after that. Thank you. How is she doing? Same. Okay. Okay. Is that her mumbling in the background? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, I know you are, baby. I know. They're coming. Do you see the responders? I don't know. I can't see out the window right now because I'm with her. Hang on. Okay, they should be arriving now. Okay. Are the children old enough to go open the door for them? Uh, the oldest ones can care for the youngest. It's fine. I can go. Okay, we have to pull pulling down the street now. Okay, I'm going to go get let them. All right, man. I'll let you go. Okay, they're here. Am I hanging up with you? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you You're very much. Welcome. You're welcome. Take care. It didn't take long for the paramedics to arrive. I remember they first strapped me into like a chair, a, like a wheelchair kind of a thing, stretcher, and then brought me outside down the stairs and onto a regular stretcher. The bathroom was upstairs? Um, no, just like it was on the first floor, but there were some stairs up to the front door of our house. So I think EMTs often have what's called a stair chair. Yeah. Yeah, they can put you in it, one's on behind you, one's ahead of you, and then takes you downstairs pretty easily. Yeah, so that must be what it was. And I remember, I think like the first time in all of this when I opened my eyes was like seeing, you know, I was in the back of the ambulance and seeing my feet in, in front of me. They were starting an IV. We lived really close to a hospital, like half a mile, but they decided that they needed to go to the bigger hospital, which is more like 15 minutes away. I had been in an ambulance 
once before with my son. He was transferred from one hospital hospital to another. Um, when he was nine, he had meningitis. So I, I had been in, in the back of an ambulance in that capacity. And I remember we got into Boston that time and we were in bad traffic. And I remember saying like, well, can't you just, you know, put the lights and sirens on? Like we're in an ambulance. You don't have to be in traffic. And the paramedics at the time were like, oh, no, no, no. Like we only do that if it's a real emergency. So we'll, we'll endure the, the traffic. And so when I was in the back of the ambulance, this time and they put the lights and sirens on i thought oh fuck like that's not good if if they're thinking we need to have lights and sirens to get to the hospital i know that means they think it's a pretty big deal even though they didn't say that directly to you of course no they didn't i mean you know obviously there was urgency i think they had gotten one bad blood pressure reading my pulse was high. They had no idea where or why I was bleeding. And we didn't know if it was going to continue or, or what was happening. It was just random. I had had an experience previously. I mentioned other times I'd been in pain. And so I, I had had a burst ovarian cyst when I was in college, and I lost about half of my blood internally. And so I remembered that feeling, and, and this felt familiar to it. And I was like, I just need blood. They just need to give me some blood. And so I sort of like arrived at the hospital being like, they're going to give me blood. Like, that's what I was thinking. Like, they'll give me blood and I'll be okay. They didn't though. <laughs> so I remember they, we, we lights and sirens all the way to the hospital and I'm wheeled in and left in this ER room, left there completely alone. I didn't have a nurse, the paramedics didn't stay. I didn't have any way to reach anyone. I wasn't hooked up to any monitors. And I felt like, what do I, like, I can't move. And they've forgotten me. Where was Meg during this? So she was trying to, you know, just secure all the kids. And then she drove in her own car. So she was actually the first person who came in before a nurse had even come in to see me. So she, she arrived and I was like, oh, Thank goodness. Like someone is here. Someone knows you're there, even if it's not one of the medical people. Yeah. But I was like, wait, we, we lights and sirened all the way here. And now I'm just alone in a room. That, yeah, that part was very disconcerting. And then nurses came in, eventually a doctor. I was on an IV, but they did not hook me up to blood. They wanted to see what my levels were first. And then they sent me for a CT scan to sort of check what was going on. Yeah, a CT scan basically creates an image of the inside of your body, right? Yeah. And right from the early times, people would be coming in and they'd be like, so you had some blood in your stool? And, you know, I hadn't seen it, but Meg had. And so she would be like, no, like that's not, there, there was no stool. Like it was just blood. It was like so much blood, but they, they were definitely, you know, in a way that I now understand because I understand more about how the body works. They, they were definitely thinking like, okay, I had some blood in my poop <laughs> as opposed to like blood had been gushing out of my butt. You know, what really would have helped is if Meg would have taken a picture of the toilet yeah. And she discovered you, right? That would have painted a better picture for I them. definitely had that thought. Instead, I think the first thing she did was flush it. So, and I was still bleeding a little bit in the ER. You know, they would have a, like a little commode for me to sit on. and But at, at that point, like what I was pooping out was like blood clots. So it wasn't liquid anymore. And we would you know, every time a nurse would come in, we'd be like, there there was more. And, and she was like, yep, OK. But like no one was that worried about it. That just seems odd. I mean, I know it's the ER. They see blood all the time. Yeah. But this has to be a, somewhat out of the ordinary, though. Yeah. I mean, I think ultimately it was very out of the ordinary. But at the time, they were still thinking this is the ordinary way where sometimes people have like a hemorrhoid that bleeds. That was definitely the language they were using, like do you have hemorrhoids? Could it be an anal fissure? Things like that. 
So the ER doctor read the CT scan and what did that tell them? And that was when everything shifted because it was, you know, in, in my experience, probably like many people who aren't in the medical profession of, of what it's like to be, you know, to doctors is like from watching medical TV shows, right? So it was very much like that where the doctor comes in and, and has so, sort of like the grave expression and sat down next to the bed and said, so we've seen your CT scan and you have a large mass on your pancreas. You have other lesions on your liver. You have a dissected celiac artery. And yeah, it was very grave. It was very like, most likely you have pancreatic cancer that's spread and is advanced. It just felt like it came out of nowhere. I mean, obviously I thought about that pain I'd been having and okay, so I guess that could have been my pancreas all this time. And when we were like, okay, so what, how is this related to the bleeding? They still were like, oh, no, you know, probably you have a hemorrhoid or an anal fissure and this is an incidental finding. They thought it was totally unrelated to the fact that I had just had this huge loss of blood out my butt. They thought, you know, I guess that's sometimes the way pancreatic cancer is diagnosed is it's an incidental finding on a CT scan. It still seems too coincidental, though. Yeah. To me, it seemed really like that. Like what? Like. I'm not a doctor and this doesn't make sense unless it's just like my whole body is ravaged with cancer and things are just like liquefying into blood. I don't know. But it didn't make sense in terms of how healthy I was, and I didn't have any systemic symptoms of cancer, but they were very grave. There wasn't, like, room for, like, maybe it's not a big deal. You know, they were, in, in fact, really wanted to make sure we understood that, like, this is not a cyst. This is a mass. This is a serious, advanced, giant mass that is, like, squishing all your other organs. I know when you hear news like that, you try to, even if it's reading between the lines, try to hear some little bit of positivity, like maybe it's not going to be so bad. Yeah. But it sounds like they weren't giving you any of that. No, they really weren't. And I remember saying to Meg, like, I just don't, I don't want this to be happening. I don't want this to be this, the story of what happened next in our life and for our kids I, I immediately went to like okay so they're gonna lose their mom and then for their whole life from now it'll be like my mom died of cancer when I was little and I you know like that's exactly where my head went and then I also felt like get me out of this hospital I do not want to be in this hospital in western Massachusetts I want to go to the big deal good hospitals in Boston so I was immediately advocating like to be transferred. And at this point, it was pretty late at night. I don't know, after 10, I think. And they were not open to transferring me. The only option if we were going to leave would be to sign out against medical advice. I decided to have Meg call my dad. He had worked at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston He's since retired, but that had been his job. So I knew he was like connected to all of that stuff. And I just, I felt like I don't want to be the grownups. Like, I don't want, like, I want to call in the grownups now to make this decision. I don't want it to be on us. I didn't want to call my mom because she had our kids and I didn't want to freak her out. So we called my dad and he talked it through with Meg and decided, you know, it was too risky for her to drive me the two hours to Boston in my current state. So we would be admitted and go from there. So you stayed in the hospital, at least for then. What was the dialogue between you and Meg like at that time? It felt like we didn't have to 
say much. Like I felt very much like we both were thinking the same things. We held each other and cried. I really didn't want her to have to leave, but because of COVID, she wasn't allowed to stay with me. And I didn't have anything. I didn't have a phone or anything. I had just come in the ambulance. So I just was then brought up to this room and left alone to sort of think about dying. It's really what I did. Let's just think about, okay, I'm dying. What are the things I want to do? I want to, you know, write letters to my kids to open at different special events in the future. I want them to somehow, I want there to be enough information so that my little one, Edith, was just turned four at the time. Like, I was like, she's not even going to remember me. What can we do to make something that she'll remember me and know how much I loved her? So that was pretty much how I spent the night. Just thinking about that and feeling like all the things I didn't do that I wanted to do. I love my job so much and the books I wanted to write. And I just started this photography project. I also work as a photographer and I'm so excited about it and just thinking like, oh, I'm not going to get to take any more pictures. And and why didn't I take more pictures? And why aren't there any pictures of me with the kids? Because I'm always the one behind the camera. I was thinking about these things. I also did have a moment, even that first night of being like, okay, but I've also lived this beautiful life. Like I got to fall in love in this way and Meg and I made it through. We created this beautiful family. Maybe that can be enough. Maybe that can be what I did, what I was here to do, and it can be enough. So. There was already like a little inkling of that coming through. A little bit of self-consoling, even though you were only yeah. 41 at this time. Yeah, I was 41. You don't, at, at, at that age, you don't really think about your own mortality, voluntarily anyway. Right. But I guess, you know, when, when people get bad news, there can be a reaction of like, why me? I, I feel like in general in life, I've always had more of a like, why not me? So I didn't feel like it was unfair or something I didn't deserve or anything like that. I just, it just felt really sad. It just felt like really sad that that's how it would all end. So you were in the hospital for a few, did you get transferred to the other hospital or did you stay in this one? I didn't, no. So I was still there at the terrible hospital, as we call it. Oh, it was just the way I imagined it would be because I've had interactions with this hospital before, uh, mostly through my kids. And the communication between departments there is just really lacking. So, you know, there was a lot of talk of like the tests they were going to do. They wanted to biopsy the mass. They wanted to get an MRI with better images. They had decided I did not qualify for a blood transfusion because my my level was 8.0 and you had to have it be lower than 8.0 to qualify because there was a blood shortage. And so I felt, you know, incredibly depleted. It was hard for me to keep my eyes open because I was so lacking in blood. People had very few questions about the bleeding that had happened. It was like the whole focus was about this mass on my pancreas and then also my dissected celiac artery, which you know, I still honestly don't totally know what that means, but I, I know it means that the celiac artery is in poor condition in some way. So they had vascular surgeons coming in, but but everyone just be like, yeah, no, that that's, you know, we should monitor it, but it's obviously it's nothing compared to this mass on your pancreas. So just focus on that. And from a medical standpoint, I guess that kind of makes sense. You know, you have to triage what's the most important and urgent issue. Right. And that big mass on your pancreas, I mean, pancreatic cancer is, that's typically yeah. not something you survive. Right. Yeah, definitely not. 
So we had put in for a transfer, but it kept being like, well, if they have a bed for you. And this was because of COVID, a lot of, you know, more routine surgeries have been delayed that were now happening. So like all the beds in all of Boston were somehow taken. So they kept being like, yes, we've approved you as a transfer, but we don't have a bed for you yet. So I spent the next few days mostly in that hospital bed waiting for someone to come in and say, we're transferring you or to come in and say, we're taking you for the MRI or we're taking you for the biopsy. But every day it kept being canceled, all the things. So like the whole time I was in the hospital, I think I was there four nights. No testing ever happened. They were testing my blood, but that's it. So I didn't have any more scans. I didn't didn't have the biopsy. I didn't get transferred. They wouldn't let me eat because it was like all of these things were maybe about to happen. So I could only have ice chips. It was really pretty horrible <laughs> to be like, I'm trapped here. I've, I've lost all this blood. I'm maybe dying. And this is where I am. And no one, uh, like the longer I stayed there, the less urgent it became for them, it seemed. <laughs> So it doesn't seem like there was any point for you to continue staying at that hospital. Yeah, that's how we felt about it. So eventually we agreed that we got them to agree to to discharge me because the biopsy wasn't going to happen until Monday, which is, you know, because it became it was a Wednesday when I went in and it it became a weekend and nothing had happened. And so then it was like, well, the the people who can do the biopsy aren't going to be here over the weekend. So I was like, okay, well, if it's not going to happen until Monday, like I can go home and wait until Monday at home. And then we got one doctor to agree to discharge me. And then his shift ended and whoever came on overnight was like, no, I'm not discharging anybody. So it was a huge battle to get out of there. We were ready to sign the against medical advice waiver, but ultimately they did discharge me. And then I went home not knowing anything. I understand you had another you had another MRI that gave more information. Yes. So what ended up happening after that was really just all of the next steps happened because of connections we had. So I don't know how it would have been if we didn't have these connections like I happened to have a client, a lactation client who was a GI doctor and she was able to pull strings to get me in for the biopsy, which they then had threatened to cancel again. So I think it was on the Monday or Tuesday that I did get in for a biopsy, which involved, it was like an upper endoscopy uh, with an ultrasound. So it was like I had to be under and everything. It wasn't just like poke a needle in me. So we had the biopsy and the surgeon said, it's really good news. I took a cup of blood out of your this thing on your pancreas, which he now was saying was a cyst, not a mass. Uh, And he said, you have a cyst full of blood. And yeah, I don't think, you know, I think it's just going to dry up at some point and no follow up needed is what he said to me. And I was like, well, okay, so 10 minutes ago, I had pancreatic cancer and now I don't need any follow up. And we still don't know about what happened where I nearly bled out. That just sounds like good news you want to grasp onto, but there's still not really <laughs> complete answers, though. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No answers at all. And I still felt horrible. You know, I still was like way under the blood quantities one is meant to have. But it was good news in that he didn't see abnormal cells and he just saw blood. That's not what cancer would look like. At that point, we had already started the process of getting in to see specialists in Boston. So we kept that appointment and we went in through a cancer diagnostic services clinic there um, at Brigham and Women's in Boston. Because I had this mass, they were willing to proceed and, and do more diagnostic work, even if we had had this biopsy that showed probably it wasn't cancer. So that's where I had an MRI. The MRI still didn't show anything really different from the CT scan. It was like, yep, there's this huge cyst we now know coming off the tail end of the pancreas and there's this dissected artery and 
at that point, they thought the lesions on my liver were not something to be concerned about. And so everyone was like, yeah, so you can have, you know, follow up with this pancreatic doctor in a few weeks and we'll see if there's anything more to do about that. And I just was like, okay, but I had this really scary thing happen where blood came pouring out of my butt and I still have this really big bloody thing inside me and we just don't know what happened. And how do we know that it's not going to happen again? Yeah, that would be the big concern. Like you're living day to day, like, oh, is it going to happen again? Exactly. And at this point, you know, I already know that my blood levels are as low as they can be. And so then I'm thinking if it does happen again, I don't have the blood to lose and live. I just really felt like it could just happen and, and I would bleed out. Is there a way to supplement your blood levels or what can you do on your own? Well, I was taking a lot of iron and blood builders because I work at a birth center as a lactation consultant. I work with midwives who are used to seeing people have, you know, postpartum hemorrhages. And so they were helping me build my blood with supplements. Were you concerned at all that you might still be bleeding internally? Yes, I was. I was concerned. And I think now in retrospect, I definitely was still bleeding and pooping out blood. But I I didn't, you know, because actually because of the supplements I was taking, a lot of them had a lot of beet powder in them. And so I was like, well, maybe my poop looks red because of that. But, you know, all along, I'm, I'm getting my blood levels tested every week during this time. And I could see that, like, they weren't going up. And sometimes they would go up and then they would go down. And that was like, well, does that mean I'm bleeding more? And then they'd be like, oh, well, it's a different lab. You know, it depends on how hydrated you are when they draw it. So there wasn't clear evidence that I was bleeding. But now, in retrospect, I know that I was. How were the children handling all of this? You seem like the type that would want to be honest and open with your kids. But, you know, like a four-year-old isn't going to understand what's going on. How do you handle this with the kids? Well, we mostly tried not to tell them about it. Especially at first when we, when we thought it was cancer, I didn't want to freak them out until we knew. Obviously, I was going to tell them. We had this whole plan. If it were cancer, if it had been, then we wanted to rent a big house at the ocean and get all the kids there and just, you know, if I had a few months to live, that's what we would do. Live at the beach with them. So we had that plan, but we wanted to wait and make sure that that's what it really was before we freaked them out. So I think they were freaked out. I'm not sure that our approach was ideal. Even if you're not saying it verbally, kids can pick up on cues, yeah. body language. And I mean, they knew that I was unwell. I was on the couch. You know, I, I had no energy to do anything because I was really like living with the minimal quantity of blood. You know, like my blood wouldn't circulate to my extremities. So it, my hands and feet were just like white and numb most of the time. I had minimal color anywhere in my body, and I was really tired. And they knew like that we were still trying to figure it out, but there really wasn't anything to tell or not tell them because nobody knew what was going on. Right. You still didn't have the answers yourself. No, I didn't. At what point do you say, I'm going to go back to living my life? Did you go back to work, or how soon did you go back to work? I probably was out of work for two weeks. And then I had gone back, but I was doing just sort of like a limited day where I would only see a couple clients a day. But, and Meg was like, was upset about this. She wanted me to just be home. But the truth is my job is not physically taxing. I'm like sitting on a couch watching people nurse their babies. So I felt like I can do that. And, you know, it would be good for me to be doing that. Obviously, like we need the money and I don't want to lose my job and I'm also losing my mind. Um, the distraction would be good. So I went back to work and then it happened again. I was at work and I was seeing a client in my lactation office and I remember feeling like some intestinal cramping of like the feeling of like you have to have diarrhea 
And at this point, <laughs> I'm still like scared to fart ever from that first time. So I didn't do that. <laughs> I didn't fart. But I felt like, uh, that's not good. And then I started to feel that fainty feeling coming over me. It wasn't like a moment that was easy for me to step out. Like it was sort of an intense lactation visit, but I ultimately was like, I have to go. I'll be right back. And I got out of my office and went to the bathroom and sat on the toilet and had diarrhea. And I, I knew it was the same thing was happening. And so I checked at this time. I did take a picture of the toilet full of blood. And incidentally, we won't have that picture on the show notes. We will no. not. No. <laughs> I did not send that one to you. How long after this was it from the first time? It had been almost exactly four weeks. So the first time was a Wednesday and this time was Tuesday. So 27 days. Yeah. I managed to get my pants back on and walk into the office where the midwives work on their laptops between seeing people and it just so happens that my best friend from forever, from college, works at the birth center as the program director. So uh, usually she's in there at her desk doing billing and everything. She was not in that day. But what I did was sort of collapse under her desk. There was a midwife there and she was like, what's go going on? And I said, it's happening. I'm bleeding. It's happening again. And I called Meg. And I said, it's happening again. I'm bleeding. And she was wanted to talk to one of the midwives. She wanted one of them to take me to the close-by hospital, not the terrible hospital where I had been stuck. So the birth center is really close to where we were living. So it was also like half a mile from that local hospital. The midwives were like, we can't, we can't just drive her. Like, we're going to call 911. Nine one one. This is Jacorda. What is the address of your emergency? Hi, I'm calling from. Um, one of our employees um, is having some um, heavy bleeding and just is fainting. Um, okay, bleeding from where? Uh, is it rectal at this point? Mm -hmm. Lex. Yep. Lexal. Rectal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what's the yeah, address? Okay. And your name? Okay, can you just verify the phone number you're calling me from in case we get disconnected? And you said this was an employee, not a patient? Right. Okay. And are you right there with the patient? Yes. All right, just a few more questions while I get some help on the way, okay? Yep. And how old is the patient? How old are you, Lex? 41. 41. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and you said that um, close I can't talk today. Has anybody tested positive for COVID-19? No. Okay. And you said it was rectal bleeding. Did we know what yeah, caused it? Yeah. Yeah. No, she's got a, um, a, a, she's got a bleed. We know this. Yeah. The pancreal. Pancreatic cyst. The pancreatic cyst. Yeah. Okay. Is there a room number there that she's in or? Not the Say it again. I'm sorry. Is there a room number there that she's in? Um, we'll have somebody right at the side door. Just come in the side door to the office. All right. She has an egg on the phone. And she's awake and she's breathing as of now? Uh, she's awake. She's pretty fuzzy. fuzzy. Her pulse okay, is so you wouldn't say she's completely alert? She's not completely. She's breathing normally? Breathing normally, yep. Okay. Any, any stroke-like symptoms at all? No, no. No, she's had a low hermanicrit, so she's this is another bleed. Okay. All right, we'll have the ambulance set it up that way. Just from now on, don't let her have anything else to eat or drink. It could cause her to be sick or have further problems, and just have her rest in the most comfortable position, okay? <laughs> she's on the floor under the desk. All right. They'll be there shortly, all right? Okay, great. Yep, bye bye. Meg was worried that if they called 911, they would insist on taking me to the bigger, farther away, terrible hospital. But luckily, when the paramedics arrived, I was in such rough condition that they said, there isn't time to take her to the faraway hospital. So that part was sorted out. But meanwhile, I'm lying on, on the floor of my office. All of the midwives are in there around me. And I was like, okay, I have to have more diarrhea. Um, 
more is, is coming. We had, they had already called 911. So I knew help was on the way. And I was like, I, I can get to the toilet. And they were like, we're not letting you get up. My blood pressure was like almost bottoming out. And so I just had to poop in my pants on the office floor in front of my bosses, which was hard. And then, you know, I just sort of gave myself over to it, I guess. Mm -hmm. I know you're, we've talked about this. You're not the type that is easily embarrassed, but yeah. this had to be pushing your limits even. It definitely did. I mean, it just feels wrong. It feels wrong to ever like release your bowels in your pants. And then to do that while you're surrounded by your bosses at your place of employment. I think any feelings I had about that were quickly replaced by just fear that I was going to bleed out. Embarrassment takes a second place to, it does. am I going to survive and this? So they called, so one of the midwives called 911. Yes, they did. Um, and at that point when she called, it was less of, it was more like, I, you know, I had reported that I was bleeding and I was lying on the floor, but I wasn't continuing to bleed at that point. And so things got a lot sketchier after that um, because my blood pressure nearly bottomed out and I blood just started pouring out of me. And it turns out that being forced to poop in my pants was actually one of the best things in terms of ultimately getting me a diagnosis and getting healed because instead of all the blood going into the toilet where it was just, you know, hearsay of like me saying this had happened and then being like, there, there, maybe you have a hemorrhoid. You know, all of the paramedics and ultimately the doctors could see the quantity of blood and that it was not bloody stool. It was blood. But yeah, it was just everywhere. I think spreading out like a big puddle of blood around me. I was lying on my back. One of the midwives was telling me to stay with us. You think of all those kids, you have to stay alive. The paramedics got IVs going in both of my arms to try to dump fluids in me. And then it was lights and sirens to the closer hospital. They said, we don't have time to go to Bay State. And this time at the ER, it was like what I imagined would have happened the first time where I was immediately surrounded by doctors and nurses. And they hooked me up to blood transfusions basically as I was wheeled into the hospital. So I was finally getting that blood I'd been wishing for. They immediately sent me up for a CT scan. So there wasn't like, you know, the first time there had been a delay of a few hours I think, by the time I actually got the CT scan. So this time it was like while I was still basically bleeding that I was in the CT scan. And that is what gave us the diagnosis. So then they could see on that scan that what was happening was my splenic artery was connected to this cyst on my pancreas. And so the artery was pumping blood into the cyst on my pancreas. And then my pancreas had created a fistula, which is like a little connection into my intestines. So that is how blood was pumping from my artery into my intestines and then out my rectum. It was something that, you know, when it first happened, I didn't understand why everyone was so confused or skeptical about what I reported in terms of how much blood I had pooped out. But that's because usually there isn't a way for blood to get into your intestines. You know, if you've bled somewhere higher in your GI tract, by the time it would get to your intestines, it would be like black and like digested blood. And this was like fresh red blood. So usually they would only see someone pooping out fresh red blood if they have a hemorrhoid or an anal fissure or some, you know, something in their colon, which I didn't have. So this was arterial blood. It was arterial blood, yeah. And it was just coming directly from, you know, an artery into my intestines by way of this pancreatic cyst fistula. So it's ironic that the big hospital couldn't figure this out. It took the little hospital yeah. to kind of yeah. to get to a 
a diagnosis. It it did. Unfortunately, so once they have the diagnosis in that small ER, they are freaked out. <laughs> they do not want anything to do with me. They do not feel like they have the capacity. They're like, we cannot keep you for one more minute. Like, basically, I'm a ticking time bomb, you know, which is also frustrating because I'm like, I have just been at home for a few weeks, like in this state. And now they're scared to keep me in the ER because they didn't have the ability to stop me from bleeding from my artery. What I needed was interventional radiology. Those are sort of like the IT people of of the doctor world. Uh, They go in through your arteries using like a CT scan to watch what they're doing as they like wind through your arteries to fix things. Yeah. What amazed me, I know you were in ICU for a week. Yeah. And they went in through your wrist. Yeah. To get to your splenic artery. Yeah. That just seems like a long way to go. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. I'm sitting here questioning why did they do that, but obviously they're the medical professionals. They knew that that's the best way to do it. Ultimately, I, you know, I, I got out of the local ER. I felt actually better than I'd felt in a long time because I'd gotten those blood transfusions. I transferred to a hospital in Boston at last, and I was in the ICU there. They tried to do the interventional radiology. Their goal was to just block off my splenic artery so I wouldn't have one anymore by filling it with coils. That was the only way to repair it without opening me up completely. Uh, which they said would be a very risky surgery. So they didn't want to do that. They went in actually through my groin. The first night I was in the hospital, they spent five hours trying, but they could not get to the damaged. Um, ultimately, it was an aneurysm in my artery. They couldn't get to it that way. So I then was just in the ICU waiting for them to decide if they were going to try again or if they needed to instead open me up and do this riskier surgery. But, you know, it was much better than my first time being in the hospital where I was just eating ice chips and everyone was delaying everything and nothing was happening. But it was not entirely different. It was a similar sort of feeling of the longer I stayed there and didn't bleed out, the less urgent my case became. And the interventional radiologists kept having to bump me because something more emergent would happen. But eventually they did, they put the coils in your splenic artery. Yeah, eventually I bled again in in the ICU and then they prioritized me and they went in through my wrist and they fixed it. And that resolved the issue completely? Yes, it did. I mean, I still had the cyst of blood on my pancreas and I still have this dissected celiac artery, which... I just have to have monitored every six months. I have a CT scan to check on it, but it's been fine. But yeah, I haven't bled. I haven't had any pain. I just, I lived. This story is obviously, it's partly about the really weird medical thing, Mm -hmm. but it's more than that. You went from thinking you were literally dying on the floor, especially the second time at your workplace. From that, you went to thinking, um, okay, terminal disease. And then, wow, I'm going to be okay. That's got to be so stressful, like a roller coaster of emotions. Yeah. What did that look like in your mind? Well, I really just feel like ever since I came out of the hospital, that after they had blocked off my artery and we, we knew what was wrong and they had fixed it, I just felt euphoric. I feel like I have been given the most amazing gift of like getting to live, something I just was taking for granted before, obviously, um, like most people do. Like we all do. Yeah. Yeah. And that is what has stayed with me. So I don't even have hard, bad feelings about any of it. Really, I just feel, yeah, euphoria about getting to be alive. And every day, I I feel very much like in the moment in a way that 
you know, I think a lot of us try to learn how to live in the moment. And it's really hard with meditation and everything. And now it's just, it's like happened to me. Like I'm, that's the only way I I know how to live right now. And it's delightful. I wish there were a way for people to get to feel this way without, you know, nearly bleeding out twice. It seems like some people would would go from, okay, well, we think you're dying. You think you're dying. We need to make plans. What's all the things that you would want to do? But now, oh, I'm okay. And some people would go back to living their normal life like, wow, that was a close one. Right. But yeah, you didn't do that. No, not, I mean, a little bit. I, I did. I, I went back to work and, and everything like that. But I did feel a lot of, um, you know, when we had had this time of thinking I was going to die and we were going to rent a big house at the ocean and all our kids would come be with us. And I, I felt like, wait, why is that only what we were going to do when I had a few months to live? Like, shouldn't we live our best life every day? not knowing if next week you're going to bleed out from your splenic artery. (laughs) Like we, we just never know what's about to happen and let's live our best life right now because we can. So yeah, that led to me doing some Zillow searching (laughs) for a big house we could buy somewhere at the ocean. It also just so happened that during this time, which was last spring, early summer, you know, the housing market was insane in the town where we had bought our house as like an extreme fixer upper six and a half years earlier, you know, the value of our house had more than doubled. So we had all this money in our house that was like, we could, we could buy a house that is so much more what we want that we would fit in because we didn't really, you know, with seven kids, it's hard to fit in any house, but we, we were so squished that once the twins had gone to college, we didn't have beds for them anymore. We had had to like take over that space because the kids were just stacked in there. And um, so they could come home and like sleep on the couch for a night. But mostly they had had to be evicted from our home, which just felt terrible to me, especially in thinking like, you know, who knows? Who knows how many days we have ever? So... Turns out we couldn't actually afford to buy a house at the ocean. <laughs> that that part couldn't come true. But it did just get me thinking about what we could do. And so we ended up finding this house that we now live in that is a very giant house. It had been a bed and breakfast for about 40 years. So it has nine or 10 bedrooms. I lose track. And it's we could afford it because it's in like a less fancy town, but it's actually more convenient to my wife's work and everything. So yeah, right after I survived everything, we decided to sell our house and move and start living our dream. We've always wanted to have farm animals. So now we have land and I just feel like don't, why would we ever delay the things we want to do. Yeah. It would be interesting if there was some way psychologically to put yourself in that state without having the big tragedy happen and the big scare. But I don't know if that's possible. Yeah. I don't know either because I think you can, you can say the words of knowing today's, this moment is what we know we have, but unless you've, felt it. It's hard to really believe it. And you, from the time, from that first incident to when you moved in was five months. Yeah. To your new house that you, you're an action taker. (laughs) I am. Yeah. Well, when I want something, I make it happen, which was, was part of, you know, the humbling experience of that. You don't get to call those shots when you're trapped in a hospital bed and maybe going to die. Like sometimes you just have to surrender, which was good, which was good for me. But in my regular life, if it's something within reach, I, I try to go for it. And, you know, I do a lot of DIY stuff because like, I'm not going to wait for someone to come 
fix this for me. I'm going to learn how to be a plumber or whatever, whatever it is. The other day, Meg put her foot down about me doing some electrical work. She was like, yeah, no, you're going to call the electrician. Speaking of maybe dying. Yeah, that's what would happen if I tried to do some electrical work. Exactly. So going through something like this, you think about all of the things that you wish you would have done. What are three things that are on your bucket list today? Well, there are, there's a book I really want to write. And for me, it's, it's creative work is what I want to do. So there's a book I want to write. There's a book I want to make that's with photographs, a a few, a few photography projects I have because I also work as a photographer. I want to turn my house into some sort of like a retreat center. I want to have build a barn and have big parties with dancing and live music. But mostly I think when I think about like what were the things I felt so disappointed I hadn't done when I thought it was all over and it was things that would like outlive me, you know, like the books I wanted to write or the pictures I wanted to take, something that would have stayed beyond me. So those are probably the things I am now most motivated to be working on whenever I have a free minute because you want to leave something. You don't want it to be like I lived and then I was gone. You want it to be like I lived and then I was gone. But look at all this. Look at this work I left. You know, I put my ideas somewhere so that they could stay. That's how you live on. Yeah. And just I I love my work so much. I love my job. I love just getting to be with my family. I I hope I never lose this feeling of gratitude and euphoria, gladness for being here. That's part of why I want to keep talking about it so I don't forget and, you know, get dragged down in the mundane of like, ah, I have to take the recycling out. It's like, I get to. I get to crush all this cardboard because I'm here <laughs> and alive. One way that you are creating your own legacy is through your photography. You mentioned that you do photography and it's kind of a side hustle for you. But that's one of the things that I was fascinated when we first met online. I went and looked. You have a a full blog that has pictures of your kids and photography projects that you've done. And I think people can look at that blog and feel like they get to know you and Meg and your kids just from the from the pictures. It it just it just exudes love and family. Looking at those oh, pictures. So glad to hear that. Yeah. So if people want to see that, your your website is lexbeach.com. That's L-E-X-B-E-A-C-H dot com. And if they want to, they can go through that site and contact you by email. Is there any part of this that we've that we haven't talked about that we should include? I don't think so. It was a crazy thing that happened and crazy things happen every day that we don't get to know about. I, you know, I now walk around life looking at people and thinking about their in insides. I'm like, gosh, all those arteries just going where they're supposed to go. That's lucky. So I hope people can hear this story and feel glad for all their inner workings working. If you'd like to see the full transcript of this episode, or if you want to see pictures of Lex and Meg and their family, You can get all of that in the show notes for this episode at whatwasthatlike.com slash 134. And in the show notes, you can also watch a video made by two of their sons, Luke and Jasper. It's a mini documentary about their family and their rabbit, Shirley. You'll enjoy it. And as I was putting together this episode and thinking about Lex's story, I learned a new word that relates to what happened to her. The word is lacicism. This has to do with disaster interrupting the regular flow of things. Just like with what happened to Lex, everything seemed normal, going along fine. Then she went through this terribly stressful time where it seemed like the worst case scenario and she might be dying. And then she got through to the other side. 
By going through that, her life is better now than it was before. That's sort of what lacticism means. There's another interesting example of that in today's listener story, and I'd love to hear what you think about this. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of discussion about this in the Facebook group, so I'd love to hear what you think. You can join us at whatwasthatlike.com slash Facebook. And now, a voicemail. Hi, Scott. My name is Phoebe. I wanted to call in and let you know that I love your show. I discovered, what was that like? About a year ago, and after hearing a couple of the recent episodes, I went back in and downloaded all of the past episodes. I just can't get enough of these stories. I especially enjoyed the story about the man who ate his own foot. I'm actually a podcast host myself, and I think I should try to get him to tell that story on my show. Anyway, I just wanted to let you know I'm really enjoying What Was That Like, and I hope you never stop. I'm Phoebe Judge. This is Criminal. Oh, wait a second. I said that out of habit. Just edit that part out. Wow, I can't believe Phoebe Judge sent me that message. No, I mean I literally cannot believe it, because it actually didn't happen. That voice and that audio was all created by AI. Pretty cool, right? It's just something I've been playing with for a while, and it's a little scary how realistic it can be. If you don't know who Phoebe Judge is, she's the host of the popular true crime podcast, Criminal. She also has the best voice in podcasting. So, no, she didn't actually send that voicemail. But Phoebe, if you happen to hear this, you're welcome to send me a real audio message anytime, and I'll play it here on the podcast. And one more thing, the newest Raw Audio episode is now live. This is Raw Audio 31. These are extra bonus episodes, all including 911 audio, that you can access and binge just by supporting the podcast for $5 a month. In this episode, we have a theme, alligator attacks. And of course, these all happen here in Florida. This episode includes five different stories. Here's a clip from one of them. 911, what is your emergency? Um, yeah, I'm out at this park over in Daisy. Mm-hmm. I think um, an alligator got this lady. You think an alligator got the lady? Yeah. You can hear that episode and the other 30 episodes by signing up to support the podcast at whatwasthatlike.com slash support. Graphics for this episode were created by Bob Bretz. Full episode transcription was created by James Lai, and I recommend both of them if you need those services. And now we're at this week's listener story. As you might know, this is how we end every episode, with a short story sent in by a listener. If you have something interesting that you can tell in about 5 to 10 minutes, email it to me at scott at whatwasthatlike.com. This week, we're hearing from a friend of mine, Jack Resider. Jack is the host of the hugely popular podcast called Darknet Diaries, which I've been listening to for years. Stay safe, and I'll see you in two weeks. When I graduated high school, I was uh, 18, and I wanted to see more of the country. Um, I live in the U.S., so I bought a 30-day unlimited Amtrak ticket. It was just me going alone. I got on the train, and I was nervous and excited. And my first leg was like a four-day train ride. I just wanted to get to the other side of the country, far away from what was possible right away. And I just had a seat on the train, no bed. And I had to somehow figure out how to sleep on the seat. And the guy was sitting next to you. He was writing a book about how to ride on trains, which was like the perfect person to be sitting next to, right? He knew all the tricks of riding on the train. It was just a fantastic traveling companion. And there was a nice family riding in the seats in front of me. And behind me was a sweet couple who was funny and generous. Like they were passing on wisdom to me through like stories and parables. And behind them was the porter, the guy who worked on the train and took care of any issues in our car and stuff. And that was who I was going to be traveling with for the next four days. This was like my little traveler pod. The first day was great. I got to know the train and the people on it, and it was just super. And I had plenty of food and things to do. And actually, I had a good night's sleep that first night, which was kind of surprising. So the next day, I was there feeling more safe and comfortable than I could have ever imagined. 
I could have easily sat next to someone who was like a horrible person, but everyone around me was just so wonderful and the whole experience was great. But this made me start to worry. Things were going too well. I started to think, oh no, does this mean something awful is going to happen to me? Why am I being so lucky right now? I don't want to be lucky now. I want to be lucky when the going gets tough or when I'm in some sort of weird situation. If I exhaust all my luck now at the beginning of this trip, is there going to be any luck left over for me in the other 28 days that I have on this train? These thoughts swarmed my brain and they started burning into my soul somehow. I started getting nervous about it. Then suddenly I felt lacticism. Just recently, I learned what this word means. I didn't know what it meant at the time, but I saw it and I was just like, oh my gosh, that reminds me of this time that I felt this way. Lacticism is a feeling you get when you want a disaster to happen, to give you some sort of clarity in life. Like when the arc of your life is just going too smooth and you want it to be kinked a little bit just to give you a sense of purpose and a new direction that you can focus on. And I was feeling this lack of cism because my opportunities just seemed unlimited and whatever I wanted to do, I could do. And that made me start to really worry that maybe I'm not going to make the best choices. If anything I could do, I can do. And I need something to guide me a little bit here to put me in a direction. And a disaster is exactly what I need to happen here because I've just been way too lucky on like the first two days of my trip. So I decided I needed to create my own disaster. I was looking out the window, drinking from a water bottle, and I made a split-second decision. I threw the water bottle into my huge backpack, upside down, with no cap on, soaking everything in my luggage, my clothes, my food, everything I had in there. And then I acted like, oh no, I just spilled my water, and it's everywhere now. And I even got the guy next to me wet a little bit on accident. I didn't mean to do that. Well, now I had a really big problem that I had to deal with. You can't just ignore this. I had to figure out a way to dry everything in my backpack when all I had was a seat on a train as my space to do it in. There were no washers or dryers on the train. It was wonderful to deal with this disaster. It was glorious. And it absolutely forced me to focus on this problem, which helped me pass the time and it gave me clarity and it got me over that feeling of lacticism. Obviously, I have no idea if causing a disaster made it so I didn't have any other disasters on that trip or if it gave me more luck in the future. It probably didn't do any of that, but the rest of the trip did go great. And that trip helped shape me into the person I am now with new perspectives and experiences in life.